this is Mark LaPere from Green Global Real Estate Education Network, and that's what we do here is we try to bring deals to our club, have them bring deals to us, and work together basically to be successful in real estate. Uh, we bring on some excellent talent every week. I don't know if you guys uh, just got back, but we had some... Uh, Pretty terrific speakers up here the last couple of weeks. And you know, all the stuff doesn't have to be the big fancy attorney guys. Uh, no, literally, we had a guy teaching about smells. Yeah. Right? The yeah. stink guy. Stink guys are great. This is where we make a lot of money. Uh, we, how many times have we bought houses that had 50 dogs or mold or crack houses or all the other good stuff that's in there? There's no crack houses in I want to find any. But anyway, and people turn them down for all these variety of reasons. And steak is one of the easiest things to get rid of. And you know, literally, that guy can make us tens of thousands of dollars by teaching us the right way or letting us know who to call and all these things about buying these type of properties. Uh, last two weeks we had uh, the, um, you know, the Hi. attorney, the, the HUD attorney. And all the problems and all the things why we should have uh, title searches. Matter of fact, just today I got a call from a property <coughs> trying to sell in Florida. And we talked about, well, geez, the, uh, if the last title was good, why was it, why it, I can't get a title insurance on the next one? She says, even though all the liens that are on my property, they're good with all those. But in 1970, 33 years before I bought the property, somebody didn't sign off on something and now I gotta go find that title insurance. They actually physically want the papers. To, and they said, we're good to close, just find us that and, and wipe that one off and we're, we don't care about all the stuff that you did. That is, you know, look at all the important stuff that you learn when you show up on a Wednesday night to learn. So that's teaching you how to make money in real estate, and that's one of the very important things we try to teach here at Green. But that's not the original reason why, you know, Steve and I set this thing up. Making money is easy. The guy at McDonald's makes money. It's not easy working anywhere. But when he has to spend four or $5,000 a year in his $30,000 a year, it gives it up in taxes. Or we make whatever we make and give up, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50,000 dollars in taxes. What did I call you when you told me how much money you paid? I said, you're an idiot. He was all That's proud. Nice. He, he, oh, I, 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 I pay 130 in taxes. He said it like proud. I called him an idiot. You know, uh, great that you make that kind of money. But you, you pay this guy, you know, a small percent of that. And you knock off, and I told him, I said, geez, uh, give $70,000 gift to his church or to his, his people or whatever you want to give. And you'll still pay the same amount of taxes, but at least $70,000 went to a charity of your choice. Uh, you know, all these little tricks of how to protect your money and save your money and defer your taxes. I'm not going to say, uh, uh, hide your taxes or anything, just defer them. I want to defer my taxes all the way down to my kid has to worry about. Mm -hmm. That's his problem, that he doesn't show up on a Wednesday. Uh, I invite him, he won't show. Uh, fortunately, they're recorded. He'll, he'll be watching these things when he's my age and wonder how to get rid of them. This is what you should be coming here to Green about. This is why you should sign up for, for a lousy 99 bucks a month and learn these things that saves it tens of thousands of dollars. So anyway, I am done. Uh, except for telling you, I still have all these checks, but you know what? 
Uh, this is also network marketing. If you guys brought some people in, I would give you checks too. You know, I just wanted to let's just show you. You know, this is a list of our teachers that we have here. There's like 35 great people here. Larry Cox who just left the room. Uh, reverse mortgages, credit restoration, uh, broker agent training, uh, how to be a salesperson, uh, how to buy and hold, how to um, how to uh, be a landlord. I mean, and on and on and on. So anyway, I will now introduce our speaker today who will actually show you how to protect your assets, uh, hopefully in a tax-free or tax-deferred way, how to protect your family, and to, uh, you know, let you live out your life. I mean, you know, the rest of your life. In a more comfortable, successful fashion. Anyway, I bring you attorney Dan Perry. Thank you for having me. Um, very much a pleasure to be here. Um, now, as we were just talking about, talking about making money, what I like to talk about with my clients is how to protect it, how to save it. Now, when you get that certified letter from Bart Durham, you're not shaking in your boots. <laughs> so, a little bit about me. My name is Daniel Perry, and I am an attorney. I focus mainly in estate planning, asset protection, and business law. I'm with the Fidelis Law Firm which is in Brentwood, right on Franklin Road. You know where the Chick-fil-A is? We're right behind that in, that in that City Park office complex. I've been practicing for about seven years now. I grew up in Indianapolis. I was born in Kansas. Lived in Cincinnati, Ohio for about 10 years. Uh, met my wife there, and she said, I got a job in Nashville, and we're moving. So we moved. And we got two... Uh, beautiful kids, uh, ages one and three. Uh, I got Will, who's three, and Landon, who's one. Uh, my wife works night, so I'm very busy. <laughs> now, when I started my, my career, I started in Southwest Ohio, doing mainly bankruptcy and uh, civil litigation and criminal defense work. But now I've really found my niche over the last four years in helping families, helping people protect what they have, and pass it on to the people that they love. So what I want to talk about first is this concept of how to title real estate. Most of the clients that come into my office do this completely wrong. So I want to go over all the different ways that you can do this. So we're going to go over um, sole ownership. So let's talk about sole ownership. If you have real estate, you buy it in your own name, and it's just you, that is sole ownership. So when you die, what happens to that? Well, you have to go through this process called probate, and it gets passed on to your heirs. If you have a will, it's going to be go to the people that you named in the will. Or if you don't have a will, it's going to go according to Tennessee law. Um, this is a process everyone has to go through if you die with assets in your name. Owning real estate in your own individual name would be, a, would be one of those assets that would have to pass. Probate in general takes a minimum of four months could be two years or longer if it's a very complicated case it does cost money to go through that process so that's sole ownership the biggest issue with sole ownership is that it comes with liability concerns you have property in your name let's say that's property that you're renting out to somebody if someone slips and falls for an example on that property they do sue you for, to collect on their damages so what could potentially be at risk would be the real estate itself, any individual assets you own, other real estate, your car, your bank account, everything in your name is at risk. The next type of, next type of titling that you could do is what's called tenants in common. So I have a question for everybody. If you own your home with your spouse as tenants in common, does your spouse automatically receive that share when you die? How many people say yes? How many people say no? How many people are afraid to admit anything in the presence of a lawyer? 
Well, the answer to that question is no. If you hold property as tenants in common, that is an interest that must be passed on through a probate court. Tenants in common is a where you hold property, could be with two people, three people, I've even seen it with 10 different people, and you hold an undivided interest in that. So let's talk about, well, I'll use an example, John and Jane. Now, John and Jane own their homes as tenants in common. John owns a one-half undivided interest in his home, and so does Jane. When John dies, he can, he can give that by way of a will to whoever he wants. It could be to his spouse, Jane. It could be to his kids. It could be to his, his neighbor, Bob, down the street. He can give that property away to anybody. The next type of joint ownership is what's called joint tenants with rights of survivorship. That's another way you can have property title. And that is just as the name indicates, when you pass away, your interest transfers to the surviving joint tenant. Example, John and Jane own their home as joint tenants with rights of survivorship. John dies, Jane inherits that property. That's what we call a non-probate asset at that point. It doesn't have to be administered through probate court. It just passes to Jane. Pretty simple there. You don't have to own property as joint tenants with a spouse. They could be owned with children. They could be owned with a business partner. But the same rules would apply. The next type of way you can title property is what's called tenants by the entirety. Now, that is very simple to do exactly what I just described, joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Same rules apply, but it's a type of titling that can only be held by a married couple. So same rules apply. John died, it passes immediately to Jane. And Jane takes on a sole, sole, joint, sole ownership. But she couldn't name her, let's say, for example, her son uh, as as a tenant by the entirety. She can name them as a tenant in common or a joint tenancy. So now I want to jump into the meat of it is, you know, what happens when a when we've got an issue with creditor problems, especially joint ownership? Well, the most the biggest problem that I see with my clients is that when you have joint ownership, you're subjecting the real estate to the creditor creditor problems of a joint owner. So one, a common example I see is I, I have a lot of clients uh, that are in their 60s and 70s, and they'll say, I want to put, I want to put Johnny on the deed. The problem with that is that if Johnny gets sued, um, even gets divorced, I've had to have that as a case before, is that property now becomes subject to Johnny's divorce proceedings. His new soon-to-be ex-wife can get part of the property in the divorce. If Johnny gets sued by anybody, the property also becomes at risk. So that's one of the main reasons why I, I have issues with joint ownership, especially in those contexts. The second is it may not avoid probate. We talked about tenants in common, that that's not going to. But there's some ways where joint tenancy is not going to either. If the joint owner predeceases you, if you die at the same time, but more, the biggest way is if that joint owner is incapacitated, can't make their own decisions, is mentally incompetent, then that is an interest that has to be administered to probate at that point because that person can no longer take possession of that property. But most importantly, it creates a taxable gift. So the example I just gave you of putting Johnny on the title of the home, putting his son Johnny on the title of the home, he just made a taxable gift that he's going to have to report to the IRS. But most importantly, it loses what's called the step up in tax basis. Now I'm going to do this very quickly and very simply. So you purchase a piece of property, let's say it's for $100,000, and then it's worth $200,000 10 years later, and you make that sale. Well, for the IRS, you have a $100,000 taxable gain. $100,000 is your cost basis, $200,000 is what you sold for, you have that capital gain. Well, when you gift property to someone else during your lifetime, that person gets what's called a carryover tax basis. So what, I'm going to use John and his son, John Jr., as an example. John puts John Jr. on the title of the home. First of all, he's just made a taxable gift. But John Jr. has just received what's called over, that's carryover tax cost basis. So when John Sr. dies, John Jr. has a $100,000 cost basis. And when he sells the property, for $200,000, he has that same $100,000 taxable gain. 
but if John Sr. simply let that property transfer at death to John Jr., John Jr. would receive what's called a stepped up cost tax basis, which means his tax basis would be $200,000, not what John Sr. paid for it. And so he could essentially sell that property immediately after John Sr.'s death and pay no capital gains taxes. That's why it's, it's so important when you're considering tax consequences when it comes to property that you think about these sorts of things. And most importantly, I should also say, joint ownership can also circumvent wishes in the will or trust. I've been involved in litigation before where we had a will. Mom was leaving everything equal to the three kids. But we had this piece of property over here where only two of the children were listed as joint owners. And what happened was we had another beneficiary in that will, that third child said, wait, I got, I got mom's will over here. We're supposed to split it three ways. And the kids say, no, you don't. We inherited it immediately after death, and they were right. But they didn't stop the kid on the will that was being disinherited from hiring a lawyer and racking up a bunch of legal fees. So these are the certain things that you need to think about when it comes to transferring property at death and planning for them. So we talked a lot about liability, and I do just want to go over a, a few cases that have been handed down um, in the state of Tennessee over the last year and a half or so. Um, one was a, a parking lot pedestrian accident. It was at a, um, it was at a Walmart. The a driver just wasn't paying attention, hit a pedestrian in the parking lot. Uh, that case received a judgment of $1.3 million. The, the owner of the building is who was liable. It was not Walmart who was actually leasing that property. Uh, one was a slip and fall at a retail store. Um, that was a $425,000 claim. Another was a slip and fall at a restaurant. Uh, that ended up settling for $250,000. Um, there was a dog bite of a seven-year-old boy at a rental property. The landlord, landowner, landlord there was liable for $300,000. Um, one was a woman was injured when a deck at her new home collapsed. Um, it was part of a real estate flip that occurred, and the, the owner that sold the property was liable to $260,000 after a judgment. Um, and a woman fractured her arm due to no railing on stairs at an apartment building and had to pay out some money there. Um, but we've also had two slip and falls on ice outside of an apartment building in the past year and a half. One received a judgment for $150,000, the other settled out of court for $45,000. So these are just a lot of ways that, especially people that own property and rent it out, and even people that own property with the intention of building up and flipping it and selling it to a new buyer can be, can be held personally liable in these situations. But I hear next uh, next Wednesday, the meeting will be at Larry's office <laughs> and Brent went over here. So I just want to let you know now. Well, I'll try not to slip and fall. What, you own this, you own this building? You can slip and fall. I, I slip all the time I go to Larry's office. I didn't fall. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, that's okay. So when I'm speaking with clients, whether it's a business owner or a real estate, professional real estate investor, one of the questions I always get is, but I have insurance on all of my properties. I've got nothing to worry about. I say, well, I like... I like icing on my cake too. And that's how I always explain that. When you're when you're setting up a business or buying or you have a real estate investment company and you're buying and selling real estate or renting it out, insurance is the icing on the cake. It's not the entire cake. That's why you want to make sure you have this structure in place. The other reason I give is that the United States insurance industry is the largest insurance industry in the world. Collectively, insurance companies in the United States generate $1.2 trillion a year. Insurance companies remain profitable by not paying claims when they, when, unless they have to, and even when they have to, paying as little as possible. If the injury is a high dollar and arguably outside the range of coverage, that person could be on the hook personally. Well, I've seen a lot of cases where it was as little as $6,000 and the insurance company said no. I had one where that I've seen where a, the insured driver 
lent the car to her boyfriend, not knowing that he didn't have a license or insurance, got into a car accident, and the insurance company said, no, we're not covering, even though the car is insured, and that woman ended up being on the hook for that accident. So there are lots of ways that you can be held liable, and so that's why I always recommend that, I know it's long, but read the insurance contract so you always know what it covers. If you have a question, you should ask, your, ask the agent that sold it to you, but make sure that you understand what's there. So I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. Can, can I ask a question before? I, yeah. Let's say you have, uh, let's take Irina, for example. She's a, a single mother mm -hmm. and a, a 20, maybe a 21 year old son. Mm -hmm. She probably has it in her name only. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, and if she wants it to go directly to her son, what would be, can, can you change the title now? Change the title now? Yeah. Well, if you change the title now, then she won't have ownership any longer. We'll just be in the I mean, I think he's leading up to that. What, in, in other words, you're asking how should she pass it to her son? Yeah, I mean, can she change it to uh, her own it, to her own it with a right to go to her son? So you can do that a number of ways, and I'll get to that okay. in a yeah. couple, yeah. couple minutes here. So another way to own real estate. Um, you can own it in the name of a, of a living trust, as an example. So here's a question. If you own real estate in the name of a revocable living trust, are your personal assets protected if you are sued? How many people say yes? If it's revocable, it's revocable. You're the first group that I've given this talk to who no one said yes to that question. Most of the people that I speak with and most of the times I give a presentation like this, they say, it's in a trust, I can't be sued. That is absolutely incorrect. If it is a revocable trust, and what we call a grantor trust, and you're the trustee, it's your assets, you can be sued. And it makes no difference whatsoever. So a revocable trust just can't do anything like that when it comes to protecting your assets. But a revocable trust can be used to protect your children's inheritance that you pass on. So for example, if you have a trust, you leave everything to your children, and it remains in that trust for their benefit, that can be protected from their creditors, <coughs> lawsuits, divorcing spouses, those types of things that can come up in their life. But it does nothing to protect your own assets during your lifetime. So finally, limited liability company or corporation. If you own real estate investments in the name of an LLC or a corporation, are your personal assets at risk due to a lawsuit? Not personally. In a perfect world, no. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> so the question you do it right. The answer is maybe. I know this is a, it's a very typical lawyer answer, but the question is maybe. Under most circumstances, if your assets are in the name of an LLC or a corporation, and you get sued as a result of you know, someone slipping and falling down a flight of stairs at one of your properties. <clears throat> Typically, your personal assets you own personally are not gonna be subject to loss from that lawsuit. And with an LLC or a corporation, a person that sues you, they're given an exclusive remedy of what's called a charging order. And that's just a fancy legal term to mean that if they won a lawsuit against you and they had a civil judgment, they're only entitled to be paid if the members of the LLC or the owners, owners or what we call shareholders of the corporation are receiving distributions in the form of profit. So that judgment creditor could attach to that. But what a judgment creditor can't do is seek to foreclose on the property in that LLC. So I get that question a lot about that aspect, and it's the charging order is the exclusive remedy that someone would have against an LLC or a corporation. Wouldn't that have something to do with whether or not they didn't do something properly? Yeah, I'm going to get to that here. So, quick, quick. Yeah. so, LLCs and corporations, they are business entities. Most importantly, they are separate legal entities. A corporation has shareholders, an LLC has members. They're both, they're both different when it comes to a structure of uh, taxes, for example. A uh, sole member LLC, it, the LLC is going to be disregarded for tax purposes. So what that means is all the income is just going to flow through to your regular 1040 tax return. 
Uh, if you have more than one member of an LLC, you're going to be resumed to be taxed as a partnership unless you elect what's called S Corp tax treatment. You want your corporation, you want your LLC to be treated as a corporation for tax purposes. A corporation, on the other hand, has very different and usually detrimental tax treatment. A corporation has what's called double taxation. What that means is that it gets taxed at the corporate level the first time, and then any profits that go out to the shareholders are going to be taxed there as well. So when I speak with real estate investors and people setting up LLCs, told their real estate properties, I always discuss that a corporation is not the most beneficial just due to the negative tax treatment it's going to receive. So I want to go through some, some examples. Um, and so we'll go over what I'm going to call uh, John Doe Incorporated. So after, after several years as a real estate investor, John and his business partner, Bill, set up, the, set up John Doe Inc. John's attorney set up the corporation, he established the bylaws, he installed the board of directors, he transferred the real estate. Annually, John Doe Inc. owed taxes on, at the corporate level, and then John and Bill both, were, both had to pay taxes on the distributions that came out to them personally. However, when John Doe Inc. was sued by one of their tenants several years later, who secured a $350,000 civil judgment, that tenant was only entitled to a charging order against the corporation, so all that they could ever attach were the distributions that were going out to John and Bill. LLCs function in much the same way in the same scenario. So let's say John and Bill set up an LLC. If we had that civil judgment for $350,000 again, they would just be able to attach on the distributions that were going on to John and Bill from the LLC. But if you own real estate in an LLC, can you still be held personally liable? Yes, the answer to that question is yes, it can't happen. I have a client I represented a couple of years ago. I'm going to change the facts just, just to uh, make it a little bit more anonymous. But And so we're going to call him James, the convenience store owner. James owned a convenience store. He was a very successful businessman and entrepreneur. He owned several other businesses. But one evening, James James's convenience store was robbed, and one of his employees was tragically killed in this robbery. His, the, that family and the estate sued James. James held an LLC. His business was appropriately set up, entitled in the name of the LLC. And the verdict that the family got was in excess of $4 million. James was held personally liable in this lawsuit. The reason was that the convenience store had had previous robberies. James knew about it, and he did nothing to secure the store and ensure it was a safer place for his employees. And so that's what they say in legal terminology called piercing the corporate veil. That's the term that a judge is going to use in a judgment. And they weren't going to let James hide behind the veil of his LLC because he didn't commit what's called corrective action. Now, there are many different ways that you can be held personally liable, even if you have an LLC or a corporation. And I'm just going to go over the most, the most obvious ones that I see pretty regularly. Uh, number one, owning business assets in your own individual name. What's the point in setting up a corporation if you're just going to have the business assets in your own name? That's, a, that's an easy way to be held personally liable. Using personal funds for your business expenses. I see this more frequently than I would like. If you have an, if you go through the trouble of setting up an LLC, setting up a corporation for asset protection purposes, you do not use that personal bank account or personal credit card for the expenses of the LLC. Set up that separate business bank account. It's an easy way for, a, for an aggressive plaintiff's attorney to seek through and hold you personally liable. My favorite one is what's called maintaining improper business records, or as I tell my clients, or even having an LLC is not going to save you. When I did a lot of litigation work, when I when I represented a plaintiff, what I would do is I when I would request the initial discovery, which is getting the evidence from the other side. So one of the main things I would always ask for is send me the business records, the annual minutes, and all the corporate records over the last ten years. You'd be more, you'd be shocked at how many times I would receive nothing because they didn't maintain any records. They didn't have any annual list. All they had was the original articles of organization. 
And that's a very easy argument for a plaintiff's attorney to say, well, you did not what's called maintain corporate formalities. Your LLC or corporation is just a shell, and I'm going to hold you as the members personally liable. It's very easy to pierce the corporate bail in that circumstance. Other ways is that I've seen before is just having inadequate capital cash in your account. I've represented businesses over the years where they were held personally liable, where they went and bought $30,000 worth of advertising expenses. They had $5,000 in their business bank account. Their idea was, well, it's going to generate the money that we're going to need. We're going to be able to pay that. We're going to make a profit. Unfortunately, <coughs> it didn't go as planned. They had $5,000 in their bank account. The creditors sought to hold them personally liable. Did succeed in that fact because they didn't hold what the court called adequate capital reserves. Maintaining incomplete or inaccurate tax records, that's another easy one. Um, just like James, the convenience store owner, failing to implement appropriate changes in your business operations when you know that you have a problem. Or failing to have a business continuation or business succession plan. One, I've been involved in these cases before where you have two business owners, uh, they're, they're going great, and then tragically one of them passes away. Well, when they pass away, that interest they held in their business, that is an asset that they own. And the court and the attorneys have to come up with a way to, to value that. And when you don't have this business succession or business continuation plan in place, sometimes it's really hard for that now sole business owner to come up with a two, three, four, or in the case that I was handling, $15 million in cash to, to buy out the estate for the rest of that business interest. It becomes very difficult. And so when you have those successful businesses, it's, you want to make sure that you have that plan in place, where the money's coming from, how it's going to be paid out, and in what circumstances. And a lot of times, life insurance can help fund those types of plans. So I want to go over what we already went over, which was some powerful options that are available to protect your assets, protect your real estate investment assets. One we already talked about, so I'll just gloss over that, the limited liability company. As long as you handle things correctly, operate it as you should as a business, it insulates your personal assets from loss due to a lawsuit, makes the only assets at risk of the LLC resulting from a charging order, and makes that the exclusive remedy for any judgment creditor that, that would file a lawsuit. The second one is what is a strategy that has developed over the last several years. Um, Tennessee passed a statute several years ago called the Tennessee Investment Services Trust Act. That's commonly referred to as the Domestic Asset Protection Trust. And it, it's developed a way, there's about six or seven states now that have these type of uh, laws on the books. And it's a way to completely insulate you from personal liability. That's a great strategy, but it does have several requirements you have to go through. So the first one is, you, if you were to establish one of these trusts and transfer assets into it, a third party trustee would have to be in control. And what that means is someone that's not you, that would now be the owner of all, of your assets, all the assets in this trust. So that's one requirement. Number two, it, it has to be unencumbered assets. So you couldn't take a piece of real estate that's encumbered with a mortgage and put it in, in, in one of these trusts. That's not going to be allowed. You have to name beneficiaries such as children, spouses, other heirs, just like you would with any other living trust. You have to make sure that transferring these assets would not render you insolvent. I had a client that came in to see me that wanted to engage in this process. He had about $5 million in assets, $3 million of that was in real estate. He wanted to transfer everything, said we can't do that, we can't make it look like that you're completely insolvent after this transfer. It can't, when you set one of these up, it can't be your intent to defraud any active creditor that's currently pursuing you. That would make it a fraudulent transfer, the creditor is still going to get to you. That could also subject you to civil and criminal liability as well. There has to be no pending or threatened legal actions against you. And you can't have any intention on filing bankruptcy when you're setting one of these up. And how the law is currently, currently written on the books is that if you were to set one of these up, and someone were to sue you two years after the date that you have transferred the asset to the trust, 
that creditor is not going to be allowed to reach through and seize or attach any of those assets. There, there is a strict limitation when it comes to bankruptcy, however. A bankruptcy court can look back its total period of 10 years on any assets you transferred in. Bankruptcy court still holds that power. About the only thing that it can't protect against would be child support orders uh, or spousal claims and divorce. Those are about the only ones that would not be protected. So really, the three options that I've seen a lot of families do that come to my office to discuss this, they'll do an LLC, they'll do a Tennessee Investment Services Trust, or they'll do a combination of the two. I do a lot of combinations of the two. And I'll just go over a quick example of how a combination of those two strategies work together. So we have the Doe family who consists of John and Jane Doe, and they were avid real estate investors and they own several properties. John and Jane's combined wealth of real estate investments was of approximately $1.5 million. And they had $4 million in IRAs, investment accounts, and other personal assets and bank accounts. After watching their friend Joe lose everything from a lawsuit, they decided to visit an attorney and learn their options. After the meeting, the Doe family set up this, this comprehensive plan to protect their assets and ensure they left behind a family legacy for their children. So first, John and Jane established the Doe Properties LLC, and then they tra transferred that real estate into, into Doe Properties LLC. The second thing they did was establish the Doe Family Tennessee Investment Services Trust and titled their membership interest from that LLC into the trust. Finally, they named their good friend James as the trustee. Now John and Jane have the peace of mind that if they are sued, the worst thing that can happen would be a charging order. And they have a lot of extra protection here because if they were to be, dis were to be sued more than two years down the road, first they'd have to reach in and pierce the trust, which is going to be difficult based on the Tennessee Investment Services Trust Act. And then they're going to have to pierce the corporate veil of the LLC to reach the assets. So John and Jay now have a very comprehensive plan that protects their assets and preserves that that $4 million plus the $1.5 million in real estate passes to their children and grandchildren. They leave that legacy for them. So when I talk about owning real estate, investment properties, the best options are to protect yourself, get educated on these types of strategies that are out there, establish a limited liability company, ensure the real estate property is entitled into the trust, perhaps establish a Tennessee Investment Services Trust, and title that membership appropriately. I speak with clients just about every day on these processes. It's something that I believe in. I've seen clients lose everything. I have, uh, right now I'm dealing with a case where a, a, it was a, a real, real a, it was a rental property burned to the ground, clearly under the insurance contract. Insurance company says, no, we're not covering it. Um, they came up with some reasons why. Um, I didn't agree with them, neither did the client. And so what we actually have to do is now we have to file an insurance bad faith lawsuit against the insurance company, causing a big headache for the client. But these are the types of things, just from my experience and what I've seen, that really people need to, need to be aware of. They need to protect their assets when they have them and pass them to, the, to their children or grandchildren or whoever they want to leave it behind to. Because nothing worse, nothing's worse than working your whole life, building up your, your wealth, developing a great business, and then losing it all just to one lawsuit, and also frivolous lawsuits. We do a lot of that as well. So that's gonna conclude uh, my presentation here. Uh, I do wanna thank you for inviting me. Hopefully I didn't go over time too much. Questions? But I do wanna open it up for questions at this time. <coughs> so is, there, is there a living trust that's uh, not revocable? So that would be the, the investment services trust that I talked about. That is an irrevocable trust. Mm. Now it is a grantor trust. You fund it during your lifetime, but because that third party person is the trustee, that's where you get that, that protection. The, Almost like a blind trust, right? That's right, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, can that also be what's called a permanent trust to give it a certain lifetime? Um, yeah. So the investment. I got one by the way. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah an investment services trust. Fifty year trust. I'm not going to be here. Going demo will be here tomorrow. Other weekers. Wow. Go uh, on. Well, anything. Everybody's everybody's still in shock and fear. Uh, Last, you got all your stuff protected or what? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you got another business partner and you got rental property, can you just do this new Tennessee investment service trust? Yeah, I mean, I have clients that just do that. I've got clients you don't have to go into an LLC first and then you No, not right? necessarily. Okay. So I, I, I represent a couple dentists, um, and they've done that before where they do the LLC right. with the investment service trust. It's kind of like trust. you're on a trial for two years. I mean, yeah. I hope you don't. What about a. What about a dead shield? Have you ever had a situation where you recommend clients place a dead shield? Not usually. Everybody's there. Uh, I'm sure you're going to get 10,000 questions. Uh, I know uh, I know. we will be contacting you uh, after this because I, I got all the work to do. Okay. Uh, Daniel Perry, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Wow. Well, fortunately, you know, Steve and I, we're, we're very uh, protected here because I have all my stuff in Lloyd's name, and he don't know about it, so if anything gets sued, everything goes to Lloyd. So thanks for signing those papers for me last week. I knew it was something, though. I knew it was <laughs> This is why we need education. I mean, I lost everything and Steve knows I had a lot of property in 2007 and, and eight I had no property so this is the main reason of green is to protect you from yeah, hey, the good times are good times I mean, nobody nobody needs an attorney right Nobody needs an attorney on the good times. Not until you need one. Not until you need one. So this is the most important part about what we try to do, is how to protect your property. And please, if you have any of that stuff wrong, this is why you have to go see Dan or wherever you are, see an attorney, get fixed up now before... Now listen, they went back 10 years in, in his corporate records. I'm going to be working on my corporate records late into the weekend, so uh, these things, maybe Dan. Uh, Dan. Yeah. So uh, does the living trust allow you to pass on your assets after your death without a probate? Yes. So there's no probate at all? No probate at all. And is there like a limitation of how much can pass or everything can pass regardless? Everything can pass that's titled in it in the living trust. And what's it cost to open up a living trust, roughly? Um, it can depend on what you want to accomplish. Uh, it can be a, as low as uh, $1,800 up to, you know, I've developed trust for, for complicated business as well, over $10,000 I charge for that. Mm -hmm. So it, it can really depend on what you have and what, what you're looking to protect. But a heck of a lot less than losing it all. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that... So that would conclude uh, this section of, you got one more question? Sure, yeah. Ahead. So so what good is a living trust that is revocable? Why would you use it? Yeah, to a couple different reasons. Avoid probate, for one, mainly for estate planning purposes. Um, you have issues with adult children, when they protect their inheritance from divorcing spouses, creditor claims, lawsuits. Um, wanting to control the distribution because you don't, want, don't believe that they would be responsible at age 25 or 30, for example. But that's mainly for estate planning purposes. Well, let's say you uh, have a son okay. and and, uh, and his wife is a moron. And so you only want the assets to go to the, to the son, but not to the wife, or vice versa, whatever the case. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to control the distribution? Yeah. Uh, with a trust, yes. With a will, no, you can't disinherit your own spouse. It's so. a moron clause. <laughs> <laughs> now, the funny thing is, last... It's not, it's not his spouse, it's his son's spouse. <coughs> oh, from a son's spouse. Son's yeah, spouse. son's spouse. Yeah, yeah. son inherits it. So, no, 
So that's, I get that question a lot for clients. And what we would do is we would set it up in a trust um, and have had, but for example, mom's, at mom's passing, it passes to the son in a separate sub-trust. Um, and all, the son can access it whenever he wants. And if he gets divorced, he still keeps it. He still keeps it. The only thing you can't control there, of course, he is, does. No, well, that, she, but if, if you, if he takes it out of her, if he takes it out of the trust, he's totally employed with the spouse, I mean, then all of that's off there. One question that you didn't answer, uh, you said if somebody slips and falls in your property, they can sue, and here's this one. You get in a car accident, can they pierce this way through your corporations? You mean if you're Somebody dead? sues me personally uh -huh. in a car accident, it's this thing. Can they get into my LLC? It's going to be very difficult. Okay, yeah. that's the LLC for you. Um, so, if people are buying multiple properties, uh, what is the best strategy? Should you put them in LLCs, or what would you suggest? Well, I always I look at it from asset protection and, and tax tax planning as well. Um, it depends if it's your primary source of income. Uh, Tennessee, we have a franchise and excise tax that gets taxed on LLCs and other corporations. If it's considered what's called passive income, meaning not your primary source of income. If you have a if you have another job on top of what you do what you do in real estate investing, then you qualify for what's called the funds exemption, and you're not going to get subject to franchise and excise tax. Franchise and excise tax, when it comes to real estate investment, can be very expensive yeah. because it can be upwards of four to eight percent sometimes of the fair market value of the property as you're holding the LLC. So it can be very expensive. And so. I always look at it from, okay, let's look at it from asset protection, but let's also look at it from tax planning. Should you put every property in, in an LLC? From an asset protection planning purpose, yes. Okay. Is so it possible? It's really right. You've been vigilant. Yeah. So I've, I've represented real estate investors in the past. I've owned lots of properties. I've wanted mm -hmm. more than 50. Um, obviously, he didn't want to set up 50 LLCs due to the cost involved in doing all that. But we we staggered them with five five per LLC. Yeah, that's what they sue you. And we, yeah, they get five of them. Now you were saying the uh, fr franchise excise tax uh, is charged if it's your primary source of income. If, yes. If the real estate is. Yes. Uh, my understanding is a partnership doesn't pay the franchise and excise tax. In a traditional partnership, yes. Could you create a partnership with two LLCs from another state? No. <laughs> Anything else? I'm, I'm going to charge you 200 bucks. You got to you pay your $99 here. You won't ask any more questions. I'm done. So, uh, all right. Well, the clock on the wall is not there anymore, so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, 722. The time for Steve. All right, let's bring up Steve Chase and I'll finish the step. Wow, good stuff, man. All right, yeah, there's always tons of questions that uh, we have. I, think, uh, um, I don't know, quite a few people in here have rental property. Um, you guys have. Several that we probably all have the type of things have been. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I'm sure people come in to you with uh, everything that is kind of floating around. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty commonplace. And, and uh, um, you don't need an attorney, you need an attorney. And I think it's generally um, pretty smart to get these things set up right. In fact, you got um, so anyway, uh, thank you everybody for coming. As you guys know, we do these meetings every Wednesday that's bring up to the public. Um, and Green is an education company, also a network marketing company. So we have a training program. We have several uh, speakers and trainers and mentors that you can engage with live and interactive online. Um, if some of you guys haven't, I know some of you have, and um, uh, I would encourage you to go to the website, learnfromgreen.com. Right up here. Um, learnfromgreen.com. Check out our uh, classes. And if you don't have uh, access,
access to the OmniJoin link, um, you can come in. To, it's the same thing that we broadcast on. So unless you've got that, I know. Um, but you can see all of our training on our website. Uh, as you guys know, if you want to become members of the company, 9997. And this is uh, 990, actually it's 1997 now. We've got some grandfather for a business center. Um, you can just come in as a student. You can come, now the, group, the people who were here before got this at a lower price, but this has gone up because we're paying for more. Um, and uh, you bring people into the company, get a spot in the downline, and you can make money introducing this to other people. Uh, we're gonna be launching in June. Um, I think on a national scale. So uh, it's gonna be pretty exciting when we do that. If, if some of you guys were on the fence and thinking about getting a download spot, now is a good time to come in um, and, uh, and get your place. Um, we're also gonna have some pretty exciting kind of step up products. Uh, we're not just leaving it at a simple online training, we're gonna have some much more involved detailed stuff. That'll be optional, um, the stuff that you can either uh, uh, introduce, sell to other people, or, or buy into. So you can make more money introducing that or, or buy into it. Um, uh, just so you guys know, we certainly encourage all of you to get together and talk about deals, invest, I mean, bring your deals. Uh, anything you got, we want to hear them. I, I think actually the, the deal you mentioned is not a bad deal. I think it's in Haynes Manor. It's up off of Mormon's Arm. 105,000 brick house, 1,100 feet, probably. I don't know. You know that area. But, um, it's uh, probably a pretty fair deal if anybody's looking to do a rehab project. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, Who's next? Uh, yeah, uh, Andrea, are you out there? Are you in the background? Yes, I'm out here. Uh, um, Who we got next week? We've, we've got uh, Deborah Bishop right. Uh, right behind you on the screen, and uh, she's going to be speaking about the buck stops here, basically how to get everything you want. Good luck with that. It was the foundational <laughs> lie. That was it. That was, uh, that was yeah. a very interesting conversation. Um, she's very intuitive. And then the week after that, we have a four-part series. Yeah. That one is the one I'm, I tend to really enjoy these, uh, you know, the, the home inspectors, the fix and flip uh, talks, that sort of thing. I'm really looking forward to that one. I had the chance, the pleasure to talk with Robert this week and we outlined the detail, uh, which is on that board, on that flyer behind you, Steve. Uh, we're gonna be talking about foundation repair, concrete leveling and brick lintel repair, waterproofing, uh, and structural and framing issues. And Robert was talking about how important the waterproofing is uh, there in Tennessee. I hadn't realized how big of a deal it was with all the hills and such, uh, but that's a, one of the things that they do a tremendous amount of work in. So I think that anybody who has property there is, should pay attention to these uh, these presentations by uh, Robert Elam. They're a good company. Thanks, Doc. <clears throat> One of the things that surprised me last week, and uh, you can testify to this, you can write your kids out of the will, but a, you can't write an adopted child out of the will. Yeah, that's right. Which, I, I mean, everybody was like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, we're not cool. Uh, they said if you brought them in with a judge, you got to bring them out with a judge. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, crazy things you learn here. All right, guys, thanks for coming. Um, See you next week.